All right. Well, today on the show, we've got Kristen Dumay. Kristen, thanks so much for being on the program. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So Kristen, you've got a brand new book, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Uh, Kristen, what does Jesus have to do with John Wayne? It really depends who you're asking. Uh, okay. So uh, I would say not a whole lot, uh, but the book is really, it's a study of white evangelical masculinity and militarism. And what it does is it looks at uh, evangelical popular writing, um, popular culture, and it traces how ideas of masculinity and even ideas about, about the Jesus of the Gospels get um, morphed into a kind of militant manhood that is based much more on Hollywood heroes like Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart and uh, John Wayne uh, as a kind of icon of this um, rugged and militant uh, ma manhood. And that that ends up, um, that's the corruption part of the subtitle, kind of corrupting the faith of uh, the traditional Christian faith and the Jesus of the Gospels. Okay. All right. And so one of the things that I, that I was fascinated with in your book is I feel like your book answers the question, how did we get here? And, and more church leaders, I, I'm a pastor, and more church leaders that I talk to, that is the question that everybody's asking, church leaders specifically. How did the church get so politically divided? All of the scandals that we see. I know, I know this is a huge question, yeah. uh, but Kristen, how did we get here? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. So, so I, I'll start by saying that this book, um, the research that uh, um, went into this book started more than 15 years ago. So, uh, you know, there's a long history to this moment uh, where we got here. It was in 2005, 2006, my attention was drawn uh, through my students, I teach at a Christian university, uh, to this burgeoning literature on Christian manhood. Um, particularly at that moment, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart was all the rage, right? Sold more than 4 million copies. Yeah. Every college guy was reading it, every church group, right? You know, so... Um, and at that time, you know, I picked up the book and I, 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 I read it and an elder just saying that God is a warrior God and man is made in his image and every man has a battle to fight. And, and then I was looking at uh, what was going on in the country at that time. And this was uh, during the Iraq war when we started to see all the survey data about white evangelicals being disproportionately supportive of preemptive war, of aggressive foreign policy, of um, condoning the use of torture, all of these things. And I started to ask, you know, how do these ideals of gender and masculinity in particular kind of mesh with what we're seeing uh, with regard to evangelical politics and particularly on the global stage? Um, so that's a bit of the background. Already at that point, I started looking at where did this come from? And it, it, it went back much, you know, longer. And I, I really settled on um, just how, how critical the Cold War era was. Cold War, Vietnam, you know, against the backdrop of the feminist movement, that's when white evangelicals started to get really, um, you know, po politically active in a partisan way. This is the origins of the religious right. But they did so in kind of in opposition to many things that were happening at the time, the anti-war movement, the feminist movement, in some cases, the civil rights movement. And all of these ended up kind of affecting the authority of white men and of white Christian men. And um, so what we see happening during that time, and they write a lot about gender and masculinity and leadership, um, at that time, they start to like, look to a rugged, quote unquote, traditional uh, American manhood, Christian manhood, as the answer to all that ails the country. Um, as a way to defend Christian America, and by that they mean through the military, and they really saw their role as evangelicals as like the guardians of this traditional virtue, and it was up to them to ensure that this would, um, you know, continue to exist, the rugged Christian manhood that could protect the nation and protect the family and really protect the faith. Yeah, and so when you say, when you say that those things, the Vietnam War and, and those things threatened white evangelical males. Can you unpack that a little more? What, what, what do you mean? How did, how were they threatened? Uh, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, well, you know, threaten the authority of white evangelical yeah, males, right. I think a little bit more accurately. Uh, so there's, uh, when you read some of these earlier books in the 1960s, and especially by the 1970s, there's a sense that there's a kind of crisis and that, um, and the, the crisis was, again, kind of multi-pronged. First of all, there's the communist threat, and that was this huge crisis. Um, and then there was the, um, uh, the fact that, you know, if you look at Vietnam in particular, as the years went by, it became increasingly clear that uh, American power wasn't what it used to be. And, um, and so, so there's a sense of what has gone wrong. What is wrong with American manhood that it can't defeat this kind of ragtag enemy of North Vietnamese? And, and, and that's when they started to look at, well, you know, what have feminists been doing? And they're emasculating American men. They're making, you know, uh, kind of macho masculinity into something to be ashamed of instead of something to claim. And so there's a sense that that feminists too, by, by challenging masculine authority, uh, were, were emasculating American men and putting the nation at peril. Um, so you have that going on, but also the civil rights movement, uh, which it's a complicated history and there are a variety of different responses within white evangelical communities to civil rights. But we do see the issue of um, school desegregation as really motivating a lot of the early um, political mobilization of white evangelical communities. Um, people like Jerry Falwell Sr., for example. Um, this really characterizes his kind of early entry into politics. And when you look at how they were talking about that, it was very much in terms of keeping the government outside of the authority of the, the parents. And um, what that meant is the authority of the patriarch because the, the, the father had the authority in the home. And so that too was seen as kind of government overreach. Um, it should be up to a father's decision how to raise his children, um, the authority over his children and keep the government out of that. And so um, kind of family values evangelicalism, I argue, can't be entirely kind of separated out from these larger issues of, of race and um, a, a broader history of what's going on in American politics at the time. Yeah, because family values, that was the religious right and, and all of those groups, that, that was what started that was what was said, family mm -hmm. values. But in your book, you, you don't say that, right? Well, you know, it's, it's not either or, right? It's, it's, well, what do we mean by family values? Family values, you know, what started it, family values have always been important, you know, as we kind of understand it to evangelicals. What does it mean to be a faithful man, a faithful woman? How should we raise our children? That is very central to white evangelical identity, you know, from James Dobson on. Uh, in, in the early 70s. And, and this was, you know, so I don't want to diminish that, but we can't separate that from these broader issues of, you know, what's going on in terms of, of desegregation, what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, on the battlefields of Vietnam. And that's what really surprised me when I, when I picked up some of these books on how to be a Christian wife, uh, how to raise your children. They were extremely political and foreign policy was front and center. So you need to be a good Christian woman by supporting your husband, supporting his leadership, because we need that to defend America against the evils of communism. I mean, it's that blatant. And that was really surprising to me just how much uh, the American nation was a part of their discussions on how to be a Christian wife and how to raise your kids. Yeah. And so before there was this redefinition of masculinity, um, wh what was the focus of gender? Was there such a focus on gender prior to this, before this? What was the thought of gender and masculinity before? Yeah. Was on the book? Uh, so, I mean, as a historian, <laughs> it's always hard to know where to start your story, right? Because there's so much change over time. And uh, that was a, a real challenge with this book. Where do I start? I kept wanting to move it back further and further. And so I have a little glimpse at the 19th century. And I wanted to do that um, to show um, that there's some continuity, especially look if you look at the American South, Southern evangelicalism and this culture of honor and kind of Southern patriarchy um, where the, the kind of white um, patriarch had authority over uh, 
uh, women and children, but also over uh, in enslaved people. And so race was a factor there. And within that understanding of Christian masculinity, violence was deemed necessary in order to achieve order. And so you can kind of see some continuities between that and where we end up um, and uh, uh, with this kind of embrace of rugged masculinity and needing to resort to violence to achieve order. That said, back in the 19th century, you can also find other models of Christian masculinity, where um, to be a, a Christian man is to show restraint, right? More of a gentlemanly understanding of Christian manhood. Um, and then that kind of morphs by the early 20th century, the er era of Teddy Roosevelt, into more of a rugged masculinity, again, kind of connected to race and nation and global power. But even then, um, in the 1910s, 1920s, there's a lot of different models of, of, of American manhood and of Christian manhood. And uh, in, the, in the first chapter, I just kind of give a quick overview to show that, yes, you had the rise of muscular Christianity in the 1910s, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also a kind of precursor of what we, what we see later in the century. But there too, it was as likely for uh, that a liberal Protestant would be embracing this muscular Christianity as a conservative. And then we have World War I, uh, and at that point, muscular Christianity is all the rage, but even then, it was liberal Protestants who are more likely to be kind of rah-rah military, military and war, and many conservative Protestants, you know, Billy Sunday aside, uh, were much more uh, ambivalent about war. And so I, I really wanted to sketch that out, that yes, you can find precursors, but but things have changed. And yeah. what we take for granted now, that conservative Protestants are kind of pro-militant masculinity, this kind of muscular Christianity, pro-war, pro-aggressive foreign policy, embracing militarism and militancy is not a given, right? That really came together in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in the context of the Cold War and through an embrace of Christian nationalism. And so that's where my story really picks up. So yes, you can find precursors, but you can also find a lot of um, uh, alternative models in the American past um, and I think that's important when we think of, you know, what's inevitable and, and what could maybe um, be rethought uh, at this particular moment. Yeah. I think that's such an important point because you can make the mistake of just assuming that Christianity has always been this way. It's very easy to do that. And especially because evangelicals themselves will, will write in those terms, right? Mm -hmm. Gender is God ordained. It's kind of static. It's always been this way. And so they'll use the language of, you know, traditional masculinity, traditional uh, femininity, uh, biblical manhood, biblical womanhood. And they're using that language to present what is really uh, a recent historical and cultural um, arrangement, right? But it's very deceptive because there, it's always masked in this language of tradition and nostalgia, that we're trying to return to something that has always been that God created and that we've lost. Yeah. So, so if we just continue to stay in that area, you said about the 40s, 50s is when we really saw the definition of masculinity change and where we're led to where we are today. What was the relationship between Christianity and politics yeah. um, at that time or even before this time? There too, there's a lot of uh, variation. And so you'll have... Um, uh, you'll have uh, many conservative uh, Protestants actually thought that it was better not to be overly involved in politics. There was a strong okay. strain of separatism, uh, you know, and, and again, going back to the First World War, you had a lot of conservative Protestants who were very ambivalent about the war um, and rejected any notion of uh, kind of Christian America. So a nation can't be Christian, you know, the soul of a nation can't be saved. And their understanding of salvation and, you know, sanctification was very individual. So it just didn't make sense to talk about a Christian nation. Again, you had, you had a variety of perspectives, but that was a kind of important uh, resistance strand, I would say. Uh, by the 1940s, you have uh, World War II coming along, uh, the kind of the good war, where it's a lot easier to be pro-military. Hmm. But that was right at the same time that the National Association of Evangelicals had come together very explicitly with the hope to kind of regroup and rebrand, feeling that conservative Protestants had lost a lot of power since the 1920s. 
and um, that they were kind of scattered across the country and they didn't have strong institutions, strong organizations. There were many of them, but they needed to band together. They needed to unify in order to exert their influence over the nation. And this was a very explicit plan um, among the NAE. And this was right at the time of, of World War II as well. And so they felt that they had this, this um, calling as faithful Christians to, um, to, to provide leadership to the nation. Um, and that's in the 1940s. And by the end of the 40s, we're right in the middle of the Cold War. And that just, you know, exacerbated the need, uh, the need to defend Christian America and the, the calling again that evangelicals felt, you know, we're Christians, we have the answers here. Mm -hmm. We can lead, we can help America be faithful. We can help America fulfill this calling in the world. And so, so they really felt that burden and jumped at that opportunity and understood that in order to do that effectively, they needed power. They needed political power and they needed cultural power and they eagerly pursued both. Yeah. As I read your book, one of the things that stood out, there, there's a, a constant theme of fear yeah. that seems to just go throughout your book. Um, what, what is it, uh, what, what role did fear play in, in the, the redefinition of masculinity and the relationship that Christianity now has with politics and what role did fear play and what were we afraid of? You know, my uh, understanding of the role that fear played changed over the course of my research for this book. Because at first I thought, uh, I, I mean, I, I really decided to write this book, even though I was, I was researching and I'd been interested, you know, more than 15 years ago, I'd set it aside. I was working on different projects. And of course, it, it was 2016 that made me think, you know, I need, I need to dust off this whole research and, and see, see what I can do with it. Um, and at that point, the narrative really was the kind of key explanation for white evangelicals and politics, particularly their support of Donald Trump, was they were just very afraid, right? They were afraid of lose, losing their power. They were afraid of demographic changes. They were afraid of losing religious liberty. Um, you know, they, were, they lived in fear under the Obama administration, you know, so fear was very much a, a, an explanatory tool to, uh, to explain the desperation for evangelicals to run into the arms of somebody like Donald Trump, a strong man. Um, so that was kind of the working theory. And when I looked back to um, uh, the Cold War history, that, that seemed to kind of confirm this, this narrative of evangelicals were very afraid and thus they embraced this kind of militancy. Um, because they were afraid of communism, which was anti-God, anti-family, and they wanted to defend Christian America. So they needed to be aggressive because of this great danger. The more I looked at closer to the surface and the, the more I, I, I looked at individuals uh, who helped create this ideology at institutions where, where this um, was kind of the reigning ideology, the more I began to kind of reverse that relationship between uh, fear and militancy. When I looked at somebody like Jerry Falwell Sr. and his uh, Falwell Baptist uh, Church, when I, um, I looked at his rhetoric, uh, you know, it was very much a rhetoric of fear, of stoking fear in the hearts of his followers so that they would look to him and he would offer them their protection. And so it was really, you know, stoking fear was a way that individual leaders uh, consolidated their own power. This was very much the case for um, organizations within the religious right. Nothing could raise money like stoking fear in the hearts of believers. Um, this was absolutely the model of Mark Driscoll's Mars Hill Church in the 1990s and early 2000s. And then this really crystallized for me when I looked at in the early 2000s on uh, the rise of Islamophobia in white evangelical circles. And what the reason I ended up looking at that so carefully is because many of the men that I had been tracking who were promoting this militant Christian manhood were the very same people who were also promoting Islamophobia. And they were doing so by um, uh, promoting the work of ex-Muslim terrorists um, who would go you know, across the country, the evangelical speaking circuit and tell Christians tell evangelicals just how dangerous and threatening Muslims were because they used to be one and they were terrorists and they were, they were out to kill um, white Christian Americans. Um, and it turns out all of these guys were frauds. 
Yeah. And, and they were exposed as frauds. And long after they were exposed as frauds, evangelical organizations and individuals continued to support them. And that's when I thought, you know, I think I need to change this cause and effect. Um, did fear prompt a militaristic and militant response? Or does militarism and an embrace of militancy require the continual stoking of fear? And that's, that's really where I end up in the book. Yeah. So could it, could it be reduced down to, we, we were afraid that we were going to lose power. Yeah. And, and so that led to, we, we, we need these kinds of, of men. We need this kind of, of, of man to lead us and to save us. And we need to make these kind of decisions politically. And so fear and power coming together. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it, it really at the heart of the story, it's, it's a story about power. Yeah. It's a story about grasping for power, maintaining power, mm -hmm. um, protecting that power at all costs. And, 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 and again, to me that as, as a, a practicing Christian myself, to me, that seems antithetical to the gospel, which if anything is a story of divesting of power of not, you know, kind of grasping the, um, the, the worldly model of Messiah or of, you know, kingship or of, of worldly power, but it, it's, it's a very countercultural way of being in the world. Um, but at the heart of this book uh, is, is really, it's the opposite. It's, it's grabbing power, but always for the sake of righteousness, right? Always for the sake of doing good um, in, their, in their own minds. And when you, when you think that God is on your side and that God wants you to claim power and that you are, you, are, you are grasping power for the sake of goodness, then the ends justify the means. And that's what we see over and over again, that when you believe God is on your side and you are called to be militant, when you are called to fight these battles, then you can, you can excuse a lot of really atrocious behavior in the name of, of Christ. Yeah. So would you, would you say that, that a lot of the definition that has been put around masculinity, was that theological or was it cultural? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, as, it's yeah, know. yeah. So as a historian, I think it's ultimately impossible to separate the two. Okay. Right. Is it theological? Is it cultural? Um, you know, you can, you can look in the Bible and you can find a Bible verse, but you know, which Bible verse are you, are you focusing on and, and which many, many are you ignoring? Mm. Um, how are you interpreting? How are you understanding that um, particular passage? Right? We all approach the scriptures uh, through um, uh, cultural lenses, through our own experience. And I mean, the gospel has always been enculturated. That's just part of who, who humans are. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's just, again, as a historian, uh, um, it's, it's just the way things are. Um, now, again, many evangelicals don't see it that way. Um, I, I think kind of key to evangelical belief is this, this confidence that they can um, have direct access to, to God's word and that it's simple easy to grasp, and, and they are simply Bible-believing Christians, and it's an uncomplicated scenario. When it comes to masculinity, you know, that just really uh, uh, doesn't hold up, and uh, you can point to many, many, you know, passages that are explicitly rejected, you know, don't turn the other cheek. Forget about loving your enemies, you know, that's not what we need to do right now uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's very cultural. But when I was looking at the popular literature, so this is, this is really a, a study of evangelical popular culture as much as anything. And what just kept jumping out at me again was how, how few Bible verses there were in these books about Christian manhood and how important Hollywood heroes were or mythical warriors or real soldiers like Douglas MacArthur and George Patton, right? That these were the, the men that Christian writers were holding up as model, um, you know, Christian, models of Christian masculinity. And that was striking to me because it seemed to go against, you know, this whole Bible believing self-conception of who evangelicals actually are. So if I had to choose, I'm definitely going to say more cultural than theological. But then what happens is the, this cultural understanding ends up shaping the theology and, and they go hand in hand. So you have the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, writers here that are really shoring up the theological, 
defenses in a way that supports this cultural model of militant patriarchy. Yeah. And more and more, it seems like people are saying, I think there was even an article that came out last week, evangelicalism is almost identified now as a political voting block rather than something theological. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think, I think it's politics. Uh, it's also cultural identity, maybe even more so than politics. You know, it finds expression in, in politics. But this, uh, and that's where gender, it just plays such an important role. You know, like, what do you value? Uh, so we're talking, you know, traditional marriage, family, um, gender difference has always been so critical um, to evangelicals kind of um, identity. And, and it's, it's what sets them apart from secular Americans, from liberals, from secular humanists, from feminists, you know, so it's, it's very personal and it's also political. Um, so, so again, I, I'm not comfortable completely separating and saying uh, evangelicalism is a political movement and not a religious movement. It's also deeply religious yeah. in a way that finds very clear and consistent political expression. And so when you look at their Bible studies, when you look at their, listen to their sermons, this is not just kind of a neutral faith that then by many people happens to have this political expression much of, of the, the, the faith formation itself forms evangelicals to identify um, in this, according to these cultural values and political values. So again, I, I hold the, the politics, the religion, and the culture together because I think that's how evangelicals experience it. Yeah. Can you give some examples of, you just now talked about faith formation and how it makes its way into our Bible studies, things like that. Can you give some examples of, of how this how this is making its way into churches and even just the Bible studies, Christian pop culture that, that we might be taking in and we're not even aware of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, first, I think, start off with something like James Dobson's focus on the family radio, right? Reaches millions for decades. It has, has reached into millions of homes. People listen to it when they're, you know, bringing their kids to school, um, running errands, doing groceries, doing housework, right? A lot of women especially are listening to it day in, day out, Christian radio, um, you know, Christian contemporary music, but the Christian radio stations are just like a kind of constant companion. And uh, it, it really do kind of affirm the beliefs and the identities of the people who are listening to it. This is not primarily, you know, an evangelistic uh, uh, outreach kind of um, operation. This is affirming and forming the identities of people who are already a part of the fold. Um, and, and in any given moment, it might not, you know, if you just take a little snapshot, it might not seem particularly political. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just somebody listening of, you know, how do I, how do I um, take care of my toddler? How do I raise my little boys? How do I, you know, um, what makes for a good Christian marriage, right? Doesn't seem all that political. But then when you, when you listen to these, when you read the books, when you, when you listen to the answers, uh, all of the answers have very clear political connotations. So what you see happening, first of all, is like this, this kind of community um, united around the consumption of, of this Christian media that forms so that, uh, you know, a, a woman who's listening to Dobson in rural Iowa is going to have a lot in common with somebody in suburban California who's, who's consuming the same media, right? And so you, you have that connection that's formed. You have this kind of community of, of trust that builds around people like Dobson and other figures who, who offer all of this, you know, freely given advice. And then you've got those very same leaders who will then turn things political and they'll take this identity, they'll take this community that's been formed, these loyalties, these kind of mutual values and say, and here's then how we have to act politically in order for, to protect these things that we already cherish. Um, so there's that. And then there's just, you know, for, for pastors or for evangelicals themselves, you know, the proliferation of small group Bible studies, right? Just small groups. There are always small groups um, in every church. And what do these groups study? They always need new material. Yeah. Um, so let's look at some of the books, you know, and that's where I first encountered these books on Christian masculinity. And, you know, they are, they're packaging and promoting a particular personal and political vision of gender. Um, but then they are being studied by men, usually kind of in gender um, uh, separated groups, 
not just as, oh, here's a, a book, take a look at it, but this is God's word, right? This is, this is how to be a Christian man, and it comes with the authority of the church structure, maybe the recommendation of the pastor, right? It comes, it's clothed in prayer, and, and so it becomes very powerful, again, in deeply forming people so that their understanding of Christianity is this. It is this ideology, and it becomes very difficult to separate one from the other. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you mentioned Wild at Heart, and there's so many other studies and things like that that, that are really popular. Um, how, has this, how has this impacted, say, women in the church, this kind of idea and these ideas and, and that sort of thing? Well, first, I want to clear up that this isn't just, you know, men perpetuating this ideology at all, that women absolutely have perpetuated this, have participated in this, um, and have found their own kind of meaning and purpose in a counterpoint, which is a, a Christian womanhood, this uh, kind of particular view of femininity, where, um, yes, it's, uh, women are to be submissive to men in their homes and in churches and in broader society. Often it extends um, to that. Um, but there's a whole kind of understanding of what that means then, um, a lot of baggage that goes along with that. Uh, things like women are to be beautiful. Um, because um, you know, sexuality is a big part of this. And God created men, filled them with testosterone, and so they have, they have a lot of aggressive sexual needs, and that's just the way they're wired. And so fortunately, God made women to meet those needs, um, but you know, only within heterosexual patriarchal marriage. Um, so that means women who are not married have to really protect purity, their own and you know, kind of social purity more generally, by not tempting men, because men will be men. Uh, and then it, there's also a really high standard for our wives. Once you do marry, then it is your responsibility as a woman to fulfill your husband's every sexual need. And again, he has many because he's filled with testosterone and so on. And so, so there are very um, clear requirements for women within this, this kind of gender system. Um, they need to be um, beautiful. They need to be very feminine. They need to be sweet and submissive and very supportive of their husbands and of male leaders, and that is their calling. And here too, this is important because it makes for a happy marriage. It's simply what God commanded. Um, but very often this, these um, books also come back to the, the American nation. And it's important because they have to prop up male egos so that men can step into their leadership roles with strength and with courage to defend Christian America. And that'll just pop up there too, you know? So, so the fate of the nation depends on women fulfilling their sweet, submissive and supportive role. So femininity, sexuality, even the sexual objectification of women is actually a part of this ideology uh, to disturbing degrees. Yeah. Is, is, a, is a piece of what you're talking about, one of the things that I've seen in these kind of studies is the, that the goal of the Christian life is to be a certain kind of man. The goal of the Christian life is to be a certain kind of woman or to have this kind of family, not, not our sanctification or conformity to Christ, but it's to be this kind of man. Is, is, is that in line with what you're talking about? Yeah, when you put it that way, it is a little startling, but, but I think that's true. There's such an emphasis on gender difference. And so, you know, kind of what is understood as proper Christian, you know, faithfulness yeah. is so highly gendered. And, um, but in a way that really makes no sense if you read the scriptures, you know, what do we do with the fruits of the spirit? love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? This is not a part of this rugged conception of Christian masculinity at all. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe self-restraint in very limited capacities, but as long as, you know, you understand that, you know, a, a guy's got to be aggressive when, when circumstances call for it. And circumstances frequently call for it when you find yourself in the midst of the culture wars or in the middle of real wars. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of traditional Christian sanctification does get set aside and replaced by, you know, how close can you model yourself after this masculine ideal or this feminine ideal? And the truth is, many evangelicals fall short 
<laughs> on both fronts, right? Most women cannot actually live with the grace and beauty that is demanded of them, and they know it. Um, many, the vast majority, I will say, of evangelical men are not out climbing mountains and, you know, <laughs> hunting for their dinner. But that doesn't mean that this doesn't shape their their lives, yeah. right? And, and one thing that I, I came to see is that many, many Christian men knew that they were not living up to this, but that didn't mean that they rejected it out of hand. Some did, some walked away from the faith, um, but many ended up just kind of, well, that still was their model of what real leadership looked like. So they knew that they weren't the alpha male, but then they might follow a Mark Driscoll who was or a Donald Trump who, you know, really had the balls to lead and to do what needed to be done. And, and that, that once I began to understand that dynamic, I saw just how pervasive um, and how powerful this ideology is, even for people who can't live up to it. Hmm. Yeah. So one of the phrases that you've used and you use it several times in your book is uh, white Christian nationalism. What is yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, essentially this idea that uh, America is a Christian nation, that it was founded as a Christian nation, that it needs to continue to be a, a Christian nation. In, in other words, it needs to be returned to this. And the white part is that is simply acknowledging that this is and always has been a white Christian ideal. Mm -hmm. That, you know, as, as much as if you want to define evangelicalism as just a set of kind of um, theological beliefs in a very kind of narrow sense, you could say that, in fact, many evangelicals do say that the majority of black Protestants are evangelicals. Um, now, most black Protestants have rejected that label. Some will still embrace it. Uh, but as a historian, I have, I have some problems with that because if you look at historically and culturally how these communities and faiths have developed, um, there are so many differences. And one of the key differences is around the idea of the Christian nation, around this idea of Christian nationalism. For the majority of Black Protestants, it makes no sense to say that America was founded as a Christian nation because, you know, most Black people were enslaved. Um, and they are well aware of the history of injustice. So kind of baptizing that with some sort of, you know, Christian America justification makes no sense. So the Black Christian tradition is much more a prophetic and critical tradition, one of trusting in God and working to, you know, achieve greater faithfulness, working for justice, you know, that, that we need to change where we are. Whereas the white evangelical perspective is, is almost the opposite. This mythical American past when all was right with the world, when Christians, white Christians had power, and this idea that we need to return to this forcefully, if need be, to regain God's favor and to live as faithful Christians. And to me, these are just diametrically opposed. And I think we're seeing that very much this summer, even in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and these deep, deep divisions around questions of race, about questions of American history, about questions of heroes. Who are our heroes? And what sort of people, men, should we hold up as American heroes that we should model ourselves after? And again, here, race um, is, is a key source of division. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is, is, the, is the line? I, I, know, I know that a lot of church leaders struggle with this issue specifically. How can we, um, church leaders can be pressured into, especially on 4th of July Sunday, a lot of church leaders feel the pressure of uh, almost worshiping America yeah. rather than being, you know, simply being, you know, having gratitude for, you know, our lives. That's, it, it's, it's a battle that a lot of church leaders uh, fight and they don't know where to land. What would you say to that? Uh, yeah. what, do you have any advice, wisdom there? What, what do you say to that? Well, first, uh, I'll say that you know, even, even the framing of this question reveals, I think, just how powerful a kind of populist movement is within white evangelicalism. And this is a question that I think uh, journalists and observers and evangelicals themselves circled around in light of 2016. Where are our evangelical leaders? And in fact, many leaders, you know, not counting Falwell and, uh, and Jeffress, were, were not strong Trump supporters, but many pastors then and continuing to today are, are dealing with um, um, 
members of their churches, um, of their communities who are pulling them very strongly in one direction. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's, that's why I think we need to rethink what leadership looks like, rethink what authority looks like, and rethink you know, what is really forming the values of people in the pews. And it may not primarily be uh, the pastor who's preaching every Sunday, which again is, is why I look to popular culture and to some of these other forces that I think are, are, are much stronger. Um, and so just to say that, yes, pastors are in a, many pastors are in a very difficult position right now. And I've talked to a, a great number of them who are reflecting this. Um, and so I don't know, my, um, <laughs> Uh, my advice, I'm not a pastor, so it's easy for me to give this advice and be to, to really push back um, and, and to, to think about what is at the heart of, the, of gospel teaching. Um, and at, with Christianity, is, it is absolutely a, a kind of universal faith that cuts across difference. It cuts across, it ought to, spiritually cut across race and nation, there's neither slave nor free, male or female, right? Like all nations are going to come together. And that seems just so clear in the scriptures that uh, if you're willing to set that aside and allow, you know, the, the, the Christian flag and the American flag in the front of the sanctuary, and if you're gonna allow this, um, I, I think we can call it an idolatry of, of nation, to displace uh, the, the, the gospel teachings, then, um, then we're going to be in a difficult situation. I think we are in a very difficult situation because so many pastors have refused or have, have decided not to push back against that, knowing just how deep the, the opposition would be. But things don't get any easier the longer you, you ignore it. Yeah, yeah. As I read your book, one of the things that jumped out to me is uh, I related to your book instantly because it sounded like a lot of church planner training that I had. And then the deeper I went in your book, you started to address that. And so for anybody that's watching and listening, if they don't understand how pervasive this is, odds are very good. They have a church leader that's been trained with this kind of, um, this kind of ideology. How, how has this infiltrated the way that church leaders are trained, uh, in today and even goes back to like you said the early 2000s yeah. that sort of thing how has this made its way in because it's in conferences seminaries books yeah, yeah uh, so I mean part of the challenge um, and thrill of writing Jesus and John Wayne was trying to understand you know how do we even talk about evangelicalism what is evangelicalism as a movement and I've talked about the importance of consumer culture popular culture in this but another aspect was just charting out all of the networks that I was that that were kind of surfacing through this research, and I had some fabulous student research assistants who helped me with this. And at one point, we had three huge pieces of butcher paper on the walls mm -hmm. with sticky notes and kind of sharpie webs connecting them all yeah. to understand. Right, you've got the Gospel Coalition here, you got Acts Twenty Nine Network, you've got just the SBC, the CBMW, you know, like the, I don't know if any of these, you know, these letters mean something to insiders. <laughs> and then you've got individuals, right? You've got John Piper and Desiring God, and then you've got Doug Wilson way over here in Idaho. What do we do with him? Oh, but look, he's connected here and he, and he's connected there. And they invite each other to the, you know, conferences are a really big thing. Yeah. And, you know, blurring each other book, each other's books and promoting each other's books. And there's a ton of money being made in all of this, I should say as well. And, and just trying to map out these networks. And I think I've only scratched, I know I've only scratched the surface, right? So much more can be done along these lines. But I think this is how we have to think about evangelicalism, not just as Christianity today, although it's part of this, not just as Wheaton College, certainly, um, and not just Paige Patterson and the SBC, but how are all of these things connected? So when it comes to church planting, and, and you probably know more about that than I do, because I've been um, uh, contacted by other folks too, saying, oh my gosh, you have no idea just how much, right, this has shaped, but you've got like the Acts 29 network, um, and just, I think the importance of Mark Driscoll too, in the early 2000s as, um, you know, I was tempted when you read some of his sermons, just incredibly crass and misogynistic and frankly disgusting. It's very easy to say, okay, outlier, right? <laughs> that was always a question as I was doing this, who's, who's mainstream and who's fringe here? And it was very hard to tell because the fringe is very closely connected to the mainstream oftentimes. But somebody like Mark Driscoll was 
such a compelling model mm. for a generation of pastors who yeah. wanted to model his success, plant churches like Mars Hill, and um, and kind of perpetuate this this brand of Christianity, and um, and it, it just a kind of power driven model, success based model, and um, that I think probably gets the gospel um, fairly wrong. Bill Hybels, I think we could throw him in 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 this mix too, where at first he was kind of outside of the story because uh, as an egalitarian, uh, and then the when the scandal came out. Um, uh, where he was deposed, I took a closer look and saw he actually had very close ties uh, to these networks as well. And 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 his model of church growth um, was um, very much in line with systems that I think very much foster abuses of power. Um, so so yes, I would say that this has has been actively um, perpetuated. Um, through not just through the United States, but globally as well. And since this book has come out just in the last few weeks, I've been contacted by Christians in um, uh, multiple continents, actually, in the Netherlands, in Kenya, in Brazil, in Honduras, uh, you know, just saying how much this particular brand of white American evangelicalism has been exported and what the consequences are looking like on the ground um, globally. And, and it really is chilling. Yeah. And is it that is is that what's led to, because, and you even deal with this, I believe it's really, it, you really uh, highlighted in the last chapter, I think it is in, in your book. So many of those networks and those people that you mentioned have fallen, the network fell apart. Yeah. Uh, things that were hidden yeah. have been revealed. And is it this kind of I? Is it this kind of ideology uh, that that kind of builds the culture where you can yeah. have a network or a group of churches that are covering up sexual abuse, that are covering up, covering up all of these different things? Is that so? So you just ha have a perfect storm almost. Yeah. In these, exactly. In these so, so yeah, I started, you know, exploring this topic more than 15 years ago. I set it aside for a time uh, in part because I, I just wasn't sure, you know, how mainstream is this really? Uh, but in ensuing years, I kept watching some of the key figures that I had been tracing and one after another became implicated in yep. sexual abuse scandals, either directly or indirectly by covering up for friends of theirs. And, um, and I was tracking this for years through Christian blogs, actually. Um, blogs written by sexual abuse survivors and activists. And when I first decided to write this book in, for real in 2017, uh, one of the first things I did was actually talk with a lawyer um, because I knew this needed to be a part of the story. I knew the sexual abuse within evangelical communities needed to be a part of the story. But at that point, it was still largely existing just in the blogosphere. So I thought, can I use this? Am I going to be sued? You know, And um, in, within months, right? Me Too, Church Too movement started to happen, and the national media started to pay attention to the stories that had already existed on blogs, um, sometimes for, for many years, and the information that had been gathered. And so it really kind of went national, the story. And so then it was all accessible to me to use without any um, um, a fear, uh, because it had been kind of validated by the national media. But, but I just want to give credit to the victims themselves are survivors mm. and advocates who really brought this to light um, before the Me Too Church Two movement. Uh, and yeah, it was it was important to me to keep that a part of the story because although many evangelicals will be very quick to point the finger at Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby or Bill Hybels, if you will, and to suggest that this is not this is not a a, a problem unique to conservative evangelicals, um, fair. I would say that the ways in which authority has been structured in white evangelical communities, the expectations placed on women, and uh, again, the need to kind of prop up masculine authority for the sake of the church, for the sake of the gospel, uh, means that time and again, we see the same patterns. Um, when abuse surfaces, women, even children are frequently blamed for seducing men, for right, for causing men to trip up, and so much grace and forgiveness is given to men, right? The cover-ups are are just uh, you know, very frequent, very harmful to victims, 
and, and that these are the patterns that we see over and over again, and that they are justified um, in terms of, you know, not harming the gospel witness. Mm. Um, and, and it's just devastating, really, I think, for victims and for, frankly, the gospel witness in the long haul. Yeah. So, Kristen, what do we do? I mean, the last, the last uh, paragraph of your book, you, you, you throw out there uh, the idea of dismantling this ideology. Yeah. How, can, how does that even begin? How could, we, how could that happen? Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny because I, 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 I give readers the last sentence. Uh, my, my, my editor, you know, after it, this was a devastating book to write. It was very heavy, very hard. Um, at the same time, it was cathartic to be able to just name this, to spell this out and really just to show again that none of this was inevitable. None of this is God ordained. None of this is, you know, is authentically, you know, traditionally Christian. Um, so there was something very empowering just, just to show how this happened, how it was built over time by people in power to increase their own power. I think just spelling that out um, provides a place to start because uh, yeah, it's at the same time, having written this history, it's, it's so deeply embedded. I'm not incredibly optimistic that we can just you know, pivot. Yeah. Um, so at the end uh, of the book, my, my editor said, can you give us anything, Kristen? Can you, can you give us some hope here? It's like, I, I don't know. I don't, I can't really. So we got the last sentence. What was once done can also be undone, right? And that's this idea that we saw how it was made. It's not inevitable. I didn't have a lot of hope when, when I finished the book a year ago. It was in production. Now the book has been out a few weeks and I will say I have been astounded by the response within evangelical communities. Um, they have embraced this book. Many, many people have. Um, I, I have, I think, more than 150 letters so far from evangelicals who are reading it and saying, this is the story of my life and we need to change this. And, and so I guess I do have some hope. How do we go about that? Um, I think we have, to, I think we need new institutions, new organizations. We need boldness. Um, there is so much silence and coerced silence in Christian communities, not wanting to offend, pastors not wanting to lose jobs college professors not wanting to lose jobs. There is so much, I think, um, uh, potential opposition to this corruption that we've seen that if we can embolden people to speak out and if, if you lose your job, if you, if you lose your church, um, it's a time to build new, new, new communities, um, new organizations. Um, and I've never been actually more optimistic for change than I am now simply because we are in a such an historically unprecedented moment of crisis and that that could um, actually um, facilitate change here. But it will take courage and it will take courage in community. It's very hard to strike out against this on your own. It's much easier to do so in community with others who are trying to achieve the same goals. Yeah. Well, Kristen, the, the book is fascinating. Uh, like I said, I, I feel like so much of it just answers the question how we got here and uh, I, I just can't say enough about it. Thank you so much for uh, being on here today. Now, Kristen, if people who are watching this, they're listening to this, they wanted to connect with you, uh, how could they do that? So I have a website, kristendumez.com. Dumez is D-U-M-E-Z, sounds like, or looks like Dumez. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, at KK Dumez, and I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook author page, Kristen Kovas Dumez, and I'm very active in all those places and have found a, just a really great community um, to talk about these things and to encourage each other in those spaces. Great. And we'll link to all that in the, uh, in the show notes. Kristen, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you.